Well, Mulligan National Monument was uh, authorized back in 1934 basically to preserve these uh, prehistoric mounds. That's all they thought was here uh, when the park was first authorized. Uh, back in the, the 1930s, before the park was even established, while the locals were still working with the legislature trying to get this park uh, authorized and established, the locals also realized that this might be an ideal location for a uh, New Deal works project. And so once again, working with the legislature, uh, they managed to get this designated as a WPA work site. And working with the Smithsonian, they actually sent down uh, two Smithsonian archeologists, and those two men ended up overseeing a workforce of 800 men. So uh, pretty, uh, pretty difficult for two archeologists to oversee that large of a, of a workforce. But uh, they basically ran trenches uh, at various locations uh, on this site. Uh, did some uh, trenches on top of the Great Temple Mound, the Lush Temple Mound, and uh, uh, they found here that huge continuum. We ended up uh, with over two and a half million items that uh, this uh, dig found uh, in, this, uh, in this location. We discovered it had a time period that goes back to the Ice Age mammoth hunters, and this site was then used ever since that first arrival of, of humans here in the southeast. So it's uh, Old Mulligan National Monument referred to locally as the Indian Mounds, but the park is so much more than mounds. It is, uh, once again, the whole prehistory of, of the southeast. The mounds were built by uh, a group that the archaeologists call the Mississippian people. Uh, Mississippian culture is a very widespread culture. It's actually hub is uh, near St. Louis at a place, place called Cahokia. And that philosophy, that mound building uh, uh, religion or whatever it was, uh, spread throughout the eastern half of the United States. Altmulgee uh, is kind of considered the hub of the Mississippian culture here in the southeast. Kind of like, uh, I guess maybe a sub-capital to the, the main capital uh, there at uh, Cahokia. And this society, the Mississippians, existed on this site for over 300 years. Now, uh, after that period of time, uh, for some reason, they left this site. Uh, we have no idea why, what happened, if it was uh, you know, change in climate, uh, change in uh, you know, uh, religious beliefs, or, you know, uh, or what. Maybe it might have been warfare, who knows. But uh, this site uh, was uh, abandoned, and then about 100 years later, the Park Service has a site uh, just a, about a mile and a half south of here along the Okmulgee River called uh, Lamar. A uh, little different culture, still a mound building culture. Uh, the Mar culture then is the one who DeSoto came in contact with in, in 1540. Uh, then unfortunately with the arrival of DeSoto, that greatly affected the prehistoric peoples. Some archaeologists I've heard talk about as much as 70 to 80 percent loss of life. After that great loss of life, that according to the Muscogee Creek oral tradition, is the remnants of those various uh, groups that were touched by uh, DeSoto came together uh, here at Altmulgee and sat down together and created a new confederacy of tribes. And they're going to call themselves Muscogee. And that's who now later on uh, the uh, Europeans were called the, the Creeks. And so now the they call themselves the Muscogee Creek uh, people. Uh, so this area, once again, not only has the huge uh, prehistoric history, but sacred to the historic tribes and has a very long uh, uh, historical period also. This site has seven mounds on it. But the one in back of me we refer to as the Great Temple Mount. It's the largest mound we have. It's 55 feet high on the front side. That is where uh, we believe the chief of the society, the tribe, lived. Uh, there are, uh, archaeologists did find evidence of three structures up on top of there. And uh, so that's why we believe there was a, a ramp that went up the front of it. And we believe that the chief uh, basically ran the society from, from on top of there. And then just down from that, uh, you'll see a smaller mound. That's called the Lesser Temple Mound. There was a structure up on top of that also. And unfortunately, we're not really sure how big that mound was. Uh, the railroad in the 1830s came through and took off the entire side of that mound. Now, height-wise, it may be close to original height, 
but uh, as far as width, we have no idea because the railroad took off a whole side of it uh, and they, of course, they, they didn't care to uh, photograph it or mention it, uh, so we have no idea how much they removed. Also up here, just away from the Great Temple Mound, uh, another one of our uh, famous mounds is what we refer to as the Funeral Mound. Uh, the Funeral Mound uh, is here. It was placed for the burial, but only apparently of uh, the high-ranking people. The number of burials that were found in the Funeral Mound definitely would not account for all the, uh, the deaths in this size of a society. Uh, so it was very evident also with some of the artifacts that were found with the burials that uh, the Funeral Mound was uh, reserved for uh, certain high-ranking individuals. Where the uh, other people were buried, we're not really sure. We're always uh, very careful about any ground disturbing we do here, and I work with the tribes on that because we never know when there might be a chance uh, that we might, uh, while digging a post hole for a sign, might hit a burial. So we are very conscious of that uh, because uh, somewhere around here there probably are literally thousands of burials. We are standing on the top of what we call the Great Temple Mound. We believe this is where the, uh, the chief lived. There were three structures in evidence up here. And we're guessing it's probably a limited, uh, you know, only certain folks were allowed to come up on top of this mound for you know, meetings with the chief or uh, you know, various religious uh, uh, meetings or uh, activities. Uh, so not everybody was probably allowed to come up here. So this uh, society probably covered uh, 20, or more miles up and down the rivers. So they would have controlled a, a very large, uh, large area. The main reason we feel this area has been used for the, uh, the millennia that it has been is because uh, it is right, uh, it's evidence of two ec uh, ecological uh, areas combined. This is the edge, what's called the fall line, which is the area between the coastal plain and the Piedmont Plateau. In fact, this mound is literally on the edge of the fall line. Uh, the Piedmont Plateau drops off at the base of this mound and from here on out becomes the coastal plain. So with these two meeting areas, you have both the, uh, uh, the plants and the animals from that, those ecosystems all both here. So you had a great variety of, of animals to choose from, plants to eat from, uh, and of course the river was right there with uh, all of its uh, foodstuffs and transportation. So you really had uh, the ideal place for these people to be over all these thousands of years because of that meeting of the two ecosystems right in this location. We are inside our earth lodge and we're looking at is the original 1,000 year old earth lodge floor. This is uh, a very interesting structure. There are 50 seats in this uh, room. From the entrance to the door, it comes around in the circle. Each seat is slightly higher and wider than the preceding seat. And 47 seats come up. And then on this bird-shaped effigy are the three main seats. Uh, the measurements uh, they use to build this are extremely accurate. Uh, it is within an inch, a few inches of being a perfect circle. It's uh, the four pillars that held up the, uh, the ceiling uh, are also within a few inches of being a perfect square. The fire pit is directly in the exact center of the, uh, uh, of the structure. So they uh, indeed did have ways of making some very, very accurate uh, measurements in building these, these structures. Uh, the only archaeological items that were found uh, was a, a conch shell, which uh, we assume was used for, for scooping, and then a, uh, uh, and a pot. Uh, so uh, you know, what else initially may have been in here, who knows. The, it ended up uh, being, uh, being burned. Uh, we have no idea if it was a ceremonial cleansing or a closing. Uh, or if indeed uh, uh, may have been an accident, a fire got, a, uh, got away, but uh, ended up, a uh, fire uh, was in here, the ceiling and everything collapsed, uh, and then that ended up preserving the floor. Uh, I guess the roof and uh, soil and so forth came down and preserved uh, uh, the site as we see it. 
We think it's very important to interpret this story to the visitors so that they can not only understand uh, this great prehistory and that indeed uh, well before, you know, uh, decades or uh, millennia before the arrival of uh, Columbus and the Europeans, they had very well established, very successful societies uh, here uh, on the North American continent. This was not an empty, uh, empty place. And so it's important to show people that uh, these were very organized uh, societies of artists, craftspeople, leaders, uh, organized societies. And then uh, we want to show, once again, uh, effect of uh, the arrival of Europeans and the establishment of the country on these people, but then also show that, yeah, they were not all wiped out. Uh, you know, the Creeks uh, you know, out in Oklahoma uh, are still very vibrant, have a great uh, uh, society out there, uh, very well organized uh, government, and, uh, you know, uh, with a great story to tell of, of their culture and their history. And it's important for people to understand uh, uh, that part of United States history and also understanding that part of Native American culture.